There's something happening here But what it is ain't exactly clear There's a man with a gun over there Telling me I got to beware I think it's time we stop Children, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going down Um, you guys wanted that song to continue, didn't you? That's a good song. Um, how many of you guys have heard that song before? Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Almost all of us. Virtually all of us, right? If you haven't, I, I don't know where you've been. Um, how many of you, now, now don't be bashful here. This is, this is okay. How many of you would remember, can remember, this song playing on the radio when you were little? Oh, well, awesome. But yeah, about, about half of you or so. That, that's so cool. Uh, how many, you know, we honor you who have gone before us. <laughs> um, uh, maybe also don't be bashful on this. Uh, how, uh, what year was that approximately? Maybe you heard on the radio. Yeah, 66, 67. Yeah, exactly, Sal. Um, what band were we listening to over, over these last 30 seconds? Yeah, wow, look at you guys. You guys are well-cultured, well-versed in uh, American folk rock. I love it. Um, anyone know um, the lead singer who wrote the song? Stephen Stills, exactly, yeah. It's super, yeah, exactly right. Um, it's super interesting. Half, you know, I'd say about half of you knew, you know, uh, who sang or who, um, what band sang this song, and, and maybe like one or two or three of you knew who wrote the song. Um, but um, almost all of us knew, um, you have know, heard this song before. Um, and today, we're going to be in Luke chapter 11 and Matthew 6. We're going to be in both of those passages. We're going to be continuing our study in, uh, our Luke study in Luke, or uh, Luke part 22. Maybe it's Luke part 23 now. But we're going to be looking at the Lord's Prayer. And, and here's why I bring up this song, is that for a lot of us, I bet it triggers a memory. I bet for a lot of us, we're sent back to a time period, maybe certain events, maybe certain milestones, kind of there's like these monumental moments in American history. Um, and actually, I'd love to hear, also don't, don't be bashful, um, what moments or scenes maybe come up when you hear, when you heard that song? Forrest Gump. Forrest Gump, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I was looking for something maybe a little more richer and deeper than that. But yeah, Forrest Gump is great, Justin, absolutely. <laughs> what else, what else? Vietnam War, exactly, and maybe more specifically the anti-Vietnam protests. Um, some others, maybe the Penn State protest, uh, the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., uh, Woodstock. Anyone think Woodstock? Uh, I know some of you probably thought Woodstock. <laughs> but this song played a, mo a, a, a significant um, piece of gathering momentum for the anti-Vietnam War in 1968. Uh, and it was one of the like, moments in American history that brought so much cultural upheaval. And here's what's so fascinating about this song is that in significant moments in history, um, in like turning points, in these moments of cultural upheaval, uh, there often emerges poems, songs that speak to the whole season that, that you're going through. Um, you know, that speak to a whole decade, maybe speak to a whole, whole nation even. And actually, I bet personally, you can probably remember milestone moments in your lives where possibly a song or a poem or even, or even a movie or something kind of just symbolizes a moment of your own personal history. They express what's happening, right? They, and also what they do is, is they create new momentum to perpetuate that movement to keep on going. And what's, what's, which is exactly the role that this song played in the late 60s and early 70s. This song actually, even today, you know, can ignite all sorts of feelings and emotions and memories and moments and, and even remind you of the movement that maybe you were a part of, that maybe you witnessed, that maybe you saw, maybe you, maybe you were a part of. And now contrast that with Jesus and the Lord's Prayer in Luke 11 and Matthew 6 who fully also intended to start a movement, right? A spiritual revival, a spiritual upheaval in our lives, a tearing down of religious uh, systems and structures to bring relationship, intimacy with the Lord, right? For you and I. 
and to help perpetuate this movement to bring that relationship and intimacy with the Lord to give us vigor and, and, and momentum in our own faith, what did Jesus do? I believe he gave us the Lord's Prayer. He gave us a poem to, that would... That would I believe he fully expected us to memorize it and have it in our, in our brain, but also to use it as a guide to keep the momentum of the movement going with full vitality and full energy, the movement that, that, that we're a part of. And the irony of the fate of this prayer is that for many of us, you know, we've heard this prayer before and, and this prayer maybe has become dead. You know, it's dead ritual Maybe it's dead tradition. You know, you hear it, you, maybe you can recite it, but it doesn't give that intended um, gusto, <laughs> that intended oomph, that breath of fresh air to our spirit that I really believe Jesus was intending to give us. And, and, and of course, I don't believe the problem is with the poem, but the problem is with us, that we've lost that original vitality, the dynamism, if you may, that this poem is about, that our prayer lives, you know, maybe might not be as full of that vigor and energy that Jesus models for us. And so in Luke uh, chapter 11, verse, verse one, it says this. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say. In Matthew's account, uh, Jesus says, pray then like this. Pray then like this. When you, Jesus says in Luke, when you pray, say. In Matthew, he says, pray then like this. A lot of the disciples would have grown up around prayer. Like prayer was not a foreign concept to them. It wasn't something that they didn't know about. You know, it was culturally normal to go to the temple, to, to see a rabbi praying to God. Uh, much of their own prayer life probably would have been reciting different prayers from scripture, uh, mostly reciting different psalms, depending on the seasons of life they're in or even where they were in, in, in the Jewish calendar. Um, so the concept of prayer is something that would not have been foreign to them. Right? They, would have, they would have known about prayer. And so it's interesting that they ask Jesus the question, teach us to pray. Because they know about prayer. They, they, they know what, 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 what prayer, at least they think they know what prayer is supposed to look like. But they still ask the question, Lord, teach us to pray. They must have seen something different in Jesus' prayer life. That when he was praying, they saw something that they wanted. They saw something that they didn't have. They saw something intimate something relational, something with power, something with energy, something with life, something that, that they hadn't experienced before. And so they asked the question to Jesus, how'd you do that? To teach us to pray like you're praying. For us today, much of our prayer life may, might be like that. I know, I know I can go through seasons where my prayer life just doesn't have that, that energy to it. It doesn't breathe. It doesn't feel like there's any kind of momentum or vigor or energy. I, I know most of us can relate to going through seasons like that, where my prayer life doesn't feel intimate with God. It doesn't feel relational. It's not marked by power and vigor and energy, you know, a, a real relational connection with the Father. Actually, Anne Lamott writes this in her kind of book, more essay about prayer. Uh, and she, she kind of confesses that most of her prayer life looks like this. And maybe you can relate. Most of her prayer life consists of, thank you, thank you, thank you. Help me, help me, help me. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> and this is how my prayer life can be sometimes. It can be fully reactionary. Because that's what that is. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Reaction to something. Help me, help me, help me. Reaction to something. You know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, reactionary. That's how my prayer life can sometimes be. You know, that there's, there's this big event in my life, and oh, I should probably pray about that, huh? Like, I should probably bring that before the Lord, or, or I really want something in my life, or I'm, really, or I'm really, like, anxious about something, and so I react to my circumstances. And, and, and that's what sparks prayer in, in my life. And Jesus here, I believe, is not showing us a reactionary way to pray in the Lord's Prayer, but a proactive way, a, a, a proactive way of cultivating a regular habit of prayer. Because of who Jesus is and, and the movement that he's starting is just so counterintuitive to like how we're conditioned that he knows that our walk with God needs perpetual, I would say, 
daily infusion of, of fresh breath and energy. And this is how our prayer life should be marked. And, and, and so what I'd like to do with the time that we have left is, is just look through the Lord's prayer. That, that you know, J- Jesus, his disciples ask the question, Lord, teach us to pray. And Jesus isn't giving some dispassionate lecture, you know, to maybe what we would perceive as possibly a silly question of teach us to pray. But what he's doing is he's giving his disciples, he's giving you and I today a gift. He's giving us a peek behind the curtain of what his own intimate relationship with the Father looks like. When Jesus would retreat in prayer, you know, in Luke, actually, it says that Jesus went to a certain place. You know, what what do you think he was praying? What do you think guided his own prayers that energized him so that he can come down off of those hills, so that he can come come out of that certain place and perpetuate the the movement of the kingdom? He's giving us his own heartbeat here. This poem, uh, that there's no better way to summarize the whole mission of Jesus than these poetic words in the Lord's Prayer. It's easy to memorize. You know, you, you get who Jesus is in it. And, and you don't just receive who Jesus is through the, through the prayer, but you become active participants in the very movement that he began. And it's so cool to me that we get this kind of peak uh, in Jesus' own walk with the Father in the Lord's Prayer, and we get invited into that space. And so to start, I'd love to put the prayer on the screen and recite it together. If you're online right now um, watching, you know, we'd love for you to speak uh, the, this prayer also out loud with us. Um, maybe you're at home in the living room with like your spouse or something, or maybe you're in a micro church or some sort of community together. We'd love for you to join us in reciting this out loud together. And so um, I think it's on the screen, right? Um, and I'd love for us to read it together. So this is the first part of it. Let's go ahead and recite it together. Join me. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This prayer is... um, Divided up into an introduction and two sections. It's, it's one way that I compartmentalize the prayer on how to uh, remember it. Um, the, the introduction is our Father in heaven. And that kind of just starts the prayer. And then it's divided into two sections. And you can see the two sections in the prayer. I even kind of divided it up on the screen that way to kind of give a hint. But uh, you can see how Jesus gives us a, cl- a poetic clue as to how it's divided up into two sections. The first part is dominated by an address um, to, to God. It's your name your kingdom, your will. That's kind of the first section. Your name, your kingdom, your will. But then it shifts to three main petitions uh, about the community and, 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 uh, and us. It's forgive us, Lead us, deliver us. Those are kind of the, the way you compartmentalize the Lord's Prayer. An introduction, uh, kind of stating, you know, who we're praying to, our Father. And then section one with, uh, with focused on God. And section two, um, focused on, you know, petitions from us. And what's co- so cool about this prayer is that it's actually structured after something we learn in Luke chapter 10. And, and, it's, and it's what Jesus says is the highest value of the kingdom. He actually calls it the greatest commandment. Um, and, and the Lord's Prayer is structured after the greatest commandment. In Luke chapter 10, verse 27, it says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Notice in the greatest commandment, there's two sections to it, isn't there? There's kind of, it's kind of a two-parter. You've got, you've got love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you, have, and, you're, and, and you have love your neighbor as yourself. And it seems to me that Jesus has given us a prayer that reflects those two priorities. That when we we first orient ourselves to the Father and express our loyalty, our allegiance, our love to the Father and his, his priorities in the world, and then we turn our attention to us. And just by the way, um, I'll be taking like a 30,000 foot view with the Lord's Prayer. Man, each, it's so, each section here is so rich with truth and, and God's, God's truth and God's, God's just life for us. But uh, I'll be taking a kind of a 30,000 foot approach. And one thing that's kind of cool that I'm not going to be able to touch on, but it's, it's that when the prayer says us, forgive us, lead us, deliver us, I do believe that Jesus really means collectively us. 
You know, because often our prayer lives can be dominated by forgive me, lead me, deliver me. It's the things that are going on in my life right here, right now, what I'm experiencing. But I believe Jesus is inviting us into a communal aspect in this prayer, uh, that this prayer is marked by community, by togetherness, by us. But this is Jesus condensing the heartbeat of the movement that he's launching. And he gives us this prayer that reflects the greatest commandment. And he begins with an address to the Father, as I mentioned, the introduction to the Lord's Prayer. It says, our Father in heaven, um, oh, that's it, that, I was about to start reciting it that, out of habit, but our Father in heaven. And the pattern of our prayer life should be marked first by connecting with God relationally. Jesus believes that when we pray, we need to be reminded continually of who we're praying to. You know, when you look at all of the prayers of Jesus, he prays to the Father almost every single time. In fact, there's only one time he doesn't pray to the Father, and it's when he's on the cross, when that relationship gets severed, when that relationship gets broken. Every other time he prays to the Father. And this is unique about Jesus. You know, Jesus made a huge emphasis of this in his own teaching because he knew he was the Son, he was the one who came to reveal the Father to us, to reveal who God is to us. You know, our God is generous. Our God is gracious. You know, he, he seeks the lost. He's moving towards people and their sin and their brokenness. And he's inviting us into these feasts, these um. The Bible calls them like forgiveness parties and banquets to celebrate the kingdom. We see who God is in Jesus that will hold this world and humanity accountable for what we've done to the place. But he invites us into repentance and a new humanity and a new life. And that's the God revealed in Jesus. That's who we're praying to. And that God is so counterintuitive to what we expect. We're so prone seeing God as like volatile, you know, ticked off, absentee landlord kind of, a, kind of a, a thought. Jesus invites us every single day to check, to redefine who God is to us by saying our Father who was revealed to us through Jesus. God is our Father. He's not distant. He's not far off. He's near. He's with you. He's close. I know for my kids, um, their favorite place to be is on my lap. If I'm, if, I'm right on, if I'm sitting on the couch, they're jumping onto my lap. You know, when, when they're sick, all they want is, there, is to be near and close to mom. You know, and this is the type of relationship that we're invited to through Jesus. Romans 8, 15 says, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. This is where everything starts in prayer. This is, this is the beginning point. This is, you know, your prayer life should be marked by a, a relational intimacy with the Father. The prayer continues. Hallowed be your name. Or, or the way our prayers should be marked, or the pattern to our prayers, should be to declare his greatness. You know, we start by connecting with him relationally, but secondly, we, we move into a time where we stand in awe of who he is. We declare praises unto God, or maybe a better way to put it is to praise God before we petition God. Because the petitions are coming, right? There's three of them at the end, but, but we praise him for who he is before we petition God. David said it this way, bless the Lord, O my soul, all that is within me, praise his holy name. We need to rule our spirit because I, I, I know for me, I, I, can, I can immediately jump to the petitions and what's going on in my life, like the Anne Lamott, help me, help me, help me, thank you, thank you, thank you, like you know, that, that whole aspect. But, but we need to rule our spirit that whether or not things are going the way we want them to go, that we need to realize that while things, might, things around us might be bad, God is still good. Although things around us might be crashing around us, God still deserves praise. David said, I'm not going to worship God when I feel like it. I'm going to worship God because he is worthy, period. And we see that in his life. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. I'm going to guess, but unless you've been to church, you know, most of your life, this actually, even if you've been to church most of your life, this is probably the only space you've ever used that word, you know, in the Lord's prayer. You know, and, and hollowed simply means regarded as holy. 
You know, the pattern of my prayer is to connect with God relationally, relationally but it's to declare his greatness. There, there is no other name like Jesus. His name is set apart. His name is hallowed. And part of the movement that Jesus invites us into is making God's name holy throughout the world. That somehow his name has been marred. His name has been misunderstood throughout history. And if you want to know why, just looking at Genesis 1 through 3 tells us what happened. And as image-bearing disciples, we bear witness to his holiness. We bear witness to his hollowedness. (laughs) Our lives should tell the story of his love. Our prayer lives should tell the story of his love. He is a good God. He is a worthy God, and we stand in awe of him. We stand in awe of the name of Jesus. Jesus is your healer, and by his stripes, oh, you are healed. Jesus is Jehovah Jireh. He is your provider. Jesus is your kinsman redeemer that you have been sanctified, set free, and cleansed. Past, present, and future. Let's make much of that name. Let's make much of that name in our prayers, what he's done in our lives. Hallowed be your name. That's how Jesus prayed. And it continues. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, like I said, I'm taking a bit of a 30,000 foot approach with this. And so I'm kind of combining these two yours. You know, I said uh, the first part of the prayer is, is your name, your kingdom, your will. And I kind of just set it up that way. And here I am combining your kingdom come, your will be done. Um, but... But the pattern to our prayer life is to submit our will. And this one isn't exactly one where we get a lot of like amens and we're all excited about, um, you know, to submit our will. Because let's, let's be honest, we came out of the womb wanting what we want. You know, we don't want to submit our will. We want to do what we want, when we want to, how we want to, you know, period. That, that, that's that's, our, that's our, in, our inclination. That's our, that's our juxta, just, juxta, juxtaposition. That's where we start. That's our base point. We want what we want. And prayer isn't about God turning to you, but it's about you turning to God. It's about submitting our will to God. This means to pray his agenda before our agenda, to pray his will over our life before anything else. And we know this is difficult, by the way, because it was difficult for Jesus. We see this in the Garden of Gethsemane, preparing to go to the cross, you know, nails in his hands, nails in his feet. And the Bible says that while he's in the garden, he dropped his sweats, he, sweats of, or beads of sweat come down in blood. He sweats drops of blood. That's what I'm trying to say. Why was he sweating blood? Because he was so overwhelmed at the thought of the mission that God has him on, the next step of his journey that he was about to carry out. And what was his prayer in that moment? Not my will, but your will. We see how difficult that was for him, and we know that's going to be a challenge for us as well. This is not a script, but it's a pattern for us to pray like Jesus. Let's continue. The fourth pattern to our prayer, give us this day our daily bread, is that we depend on him for everything. Everything. What Jesus is referencing here, the daily bread piece, is, is in the book of Exodus when the Israelites stepped out of slavery into the desert and they're headed into the promised land. They wandered the desert for 40 years, and the Bible says that God made an agreement with the Israelites that he would send manna from heaven that would feed them. And he would miraculously provide food for them every single day called manna. And what's manna? Well, we don't exactly know what manna is specifically. The Hebrew word for manna, I laughed when I read this, the Hebrew word for manna literally means what is it? That's what, that's what the Hebrew word for manna means, is what? Um, but it's known in the Bible as the bread of heaven, a wafer-like substance, you know, that was food to feed them physically. And there was really only one restriction with the manna. And, and if you know the story, you know what restriction I'm about to mention, is that they could only take enough for the day. That's it. They could only take enough food for the day. What'd they do, though? Well, they do exactly what I would do, and I would take more. You know, I, 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 I don't know if this is going to show up tomorrow. I like this stuff. It's, it's providing for me. We're in the desert. I have a family to feed. We're out in the wilderness. You know, I'm going to store this up. I'm, I'm going to hide it. I'm going to keep it for me and my family. And what happened? The Bible tells us that they would wake up the next day, and the manna would be spoiled rotten. Why? Because God was teaching them a vital lesson that the only way to get into the promised land is to trust God daily. The only way to get where God was taking them 
was to trust God for a new provision every single day. You're gonna have to trust Israelites that I'm a good father every single day. And in this prayer, we're being taught the same thing, that we need to put ourselves in a posture that we recognize and realize that we are totally dependent on God. What got me through yesterday is not gonna get me through today. What had me going yesterday is not the thing that I need for tomorrow. I need something fresh. I need something new. I need something real. I'm desperate and hungry for your presence here and now. And actually, if I try to rely on what you gave me yesterday, God, it's, it's, it's not, it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna spoil. It's not for today. And many of us, I don't know, I, I feel like in this moment right now that that we're, it feels like as, as like a culture and as a society, we're entering into a new season. That, that it feels like we're turning the page. Because just on Friday, you know, the, the mask mandate was lifted. And by the way, wasn't that an experience to go around into stores and you know, people weren't wearing masks? And, and that was, that, that, that's a bit of an adjustment. But, but I believe that, that the enemy wants us to get comfortable with trying to go backwards to how things were before the pandemic. Maybe the spiritual routines that you were in before the pandemic. The enemy wants you to go back backwards. The way we participated in church, maybe. God wants you to go, or sorry, the enemy wants you to go backwards. But we believe that God is doing something new, that God is doing something fresh, that God has a plan and a purpose for Southlake, that God has a plan and a purpose for you in your own walk with God, that God has fresh provision for you today to take you into where he's leading you, into your promised land, that what fed you yesterday is not going to get you through today, daily bread. Prayer continues, number five. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And the next pattern to our prayer is that, um, I believe I said, uh, we need to receive and give grace. Receive and give grace. In your prayer time, when you're alone with God, are you bringing all of who you are to him? You know, your praises, your petitions, but also your brokenness, your sin, your shortcomings. First John one nine says that if we confess our sins, oh, I love this. This is such a promise. He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. The doorway into the light is through confession. I messed up. I messed up. I misaligned. I need to take time to realign myself. And when I do that, he promises to take me out of darkness that I can step into the light. You know, what, why do I do this? Because I, we need to remind ourselves every single day of his grace, his unmerited favor in our life, that we've done nothing to deserve his love, that as I am who I am today, I am chosen, I, I have been forgiven, I am a child of God, and so we get grace and we give grace. Some of us, you know, we might have a poor interpretation of confession. Some of us, I don't know, maybe, maybe you're like this, but, but you, you take the approach of trying to remember every single sin in your life. You know, well, gosh, I really, I really want God's forgiveness, so let me lay it all, like, like at two o'clock, man, I, I said that thing, and at 2.15, I was driving, and there was traffic, and oh, God, you should have seen me there, and, and you know, oh, man, I, I did this at this point, and you just, you know, but, but see, confession isn't just about laying out your sin, before God, but it's remembering his grace for your sin. It's remembering his righteousness that has been poured out to you. And so as quick as I am to say that I fell, by the way, I, I've mentioned this before, and it's kind of like a, like a thing that we say here at Southlake, but the, the Mike Meek's uh, definition of spiritual maturity is being quicker to repent from my sin than the last time. And I'll say that one more time because it's so good. Um, his definition of spiritual maturity is being quicker to, to repent than the last time. Um, and, I, and I love that because, because the quicker I turn back to God, uh, the, the quicker I can receive his forgiveness and the quicker I can, I can move forward in his grace. I need to be quick to confess that I am more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus, that greater is he who is in me than it is the world. I need to confess that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And as I get grace from God, I give grace to others. 
And I love how Kip, I can't mention Mike Meeks without mentioning Kip as well, Um, uh, uh, but I I love how Kip a few weeks ago said that that a disciple is marked by kindness and gentleness. You know, when we were studying, um, I think it was James and John who wanted to bring fire down on people, that that a, a true disciple is marked by kindness and gentleness. And you may be like, oh, Jonathan, I know where you're going with this. Like, like I, okay, we're, we're talking about receiving forgiveness or receiving grace and, and giving grace out. But man, you don't know what they did to me. You know, I have someone in mind right now, but you don't know the things they said. You don't know the way they treated me. You don't know what I've been through, the things that they said. And you're right, I don't. But forgiveness has nothing to do with what they did or didn't do. Forgiveness is about being willing to absorb that pain. Forgiveness is being willing to absorb the offense and absorb the hurt. Jesus, Jesus, of course, had every right to hold on to every offense and every hurt and every pain. But what did Jesus teach us? Is that the posture of real forgiveness is painful. That real forgiveness hurts. But we can do it because Christ first forgave forgave us. And my prayer for you, my prayer for us, is that while you receive the free grace of God, that you would be able to release some people in your heart that have really hurt you, really wronged you, that you would discover that as you release their offense, what you're actually, you think you're releasing them, but what you're actually doing is releasing yourself. And here's what's wild. You know, is that we're getting close to, 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 to the end of the message and, and we're just now getting to the part that, you know, takes up most of our prayers and that is, you know, petitions to God. You know, that the, the pattern of our prayer life is to connect with God relationally. We declare his name. We pray his will over our life. We depend on him for everything. We, get, we receive grace and we give grace. And finally, and this is where we'll close, it says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. The last thing we see is that we engage in spiritual warfare when we pray. We expect opposition. We expect temptation. We expect, you know, struggle. That if we're to join Jesus in this movement of bringing his kingdom to this earth, his will be done, that we would expect a fight. We would expect temptation. We would expect to be like soldiers on the front line of battle. Why? Because that's what Jesus went through. Jesus was tested. And, and, and in Jesus' prayer life, he fully expects there to be struggle, pain, and things he doesn't want to go through. But we're given full permission to ask God, don't lead us into those tests. Don't lead us into those temptations. Jesus asked the same thing in the garden. But if I have to, God, may you deliver me. If, if that is my path, if that is my journey, may my faith carry me. May, may I stay close to you. May my will be aligned to your will. May you deliver me. That the struggles that I'm going through today, the pain that I'm in today, is not an indication that you've left me, but a testimony to your presence beside me. And this is the Lord's Prayer. Um, this is the gift that Jesus has given. The, the, I really believe this is a gift that Jesus has given us. And so are you here today where maybe you're just feeling burdened and weary in your walk? Are you here today struggling perhaps in your faith with the mundane and maybe feeling like there's no vitality or, 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 or fresh air in your walk? Use this gift. Use this pattern. Use this prayer to give you new momentum, new energy, new vigor in your faithful walk with the Lord. The band can go ahead and return, and we're gonna go ahead and take communion now. Um, and so if you're online, I would encourage you to grab you know, your little communion uh, elements here. Um, and as we're kind of getting our, our communion elements ready, uh, what, I'd, I, what I'd ask you to do is, as we take communion, as we prepare our hearts for communion, I would encourage you to take a moment to examine your own heart, you know, your own walk with God. You know, has the Holy Spirit maybe spoken something to you? Um, through the Lord's Prayer? You know, is there an area of your prayer life that could use a, a fresh infusion of life, um, a, f- a fresh infusion of God's grace and love? I pray that you would receive that this morning. Uh, but I'm gonna go ahead and read from 1 Corinthians. Paul writes, The Lord Jesus, 
on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's go ahead and take the bread together. Paul continues in 1 Corinthians. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's go ahead and take the juice together. Let's go ahead and pray before we continue with the service. Father, my prayer for myself, my prayer for your people, God, is that you would breathe fresh life into our spirit. You'd breathe breathe fresh life into our bones, God. That you would ignite a fire in our heart. That you would give us exactly what we need in our prayer lives. That you'd meet us there, God. That our prayer lives would be rich with an intimate relationship with you, God. Father, I thank you for the cross. I thank you for the work of your son that gives us the opportunity to enter into that relationship with you. Father, thank you for the gift of the Lord's prayer that we get a peek into the relationship that you have with the Son. And Father, we we step into that and we, we receive and we accept that invitation today with that kind of relational intimacy in our prayer lives with you. And Father, I just wanna take a moment to lift up um, the Ukrainian people. Father, I pray for, uh, for all the suffering and and, and maybe people who are afraid right now, God, I pray that you would give them peace and that you'd give them protection, God. Father, I pray for our world leaders, that you'd give them wisdom, but, but also you'd guide them in every single step, every single decision that they make, God, that you would be present. Father, I pray that the world would reach out in solidarity in this time of crisis to, to, offer, to offer an extension of, of help, of tangible help, God, to the people who are in need. And Father, may we walk in your ways so that justice and your peace may become a reality in this world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.